Hi everyone and uh, welcome. Uh, it's been a long-ish evening. I was kind of scared. I was standing by the bathroom and I saw people getting out. I wasn't sure if it was because they were leaving for the conference or it was just employees. But I mean, I see a full room or most full room, so now I'm reassured. Anyway, this is a presentation about tooling. Uh, this one was actually a hard one to write. Uh, I usually get a clear idea of what I want to talk about and I knew I wanted to make an introduction to tooling. Uh, like. Basically, I wanted it to be like, oh, the stuff I would have, I wish I had known when I started like programming and and like how, how much can you do with tooling? But I was missing something. I thought like maybe the quality angle could be something. I wasn't so sure. So I use a very uh, technical and, uh, and complex uh, speaker trick, which is Ask Twitter. Uh, so yeah, original speaker trick, please do not steal it. Uh, and I just say, hey, what, what, what kind of stuff do you expect? I already had basically this outline in mind. Uh, but I wasn't sure what people would answer to me, like what definition of quality will they have. And hopefully uh, Chris came to help with also a great graph. Like I, the guy just write my slide at this point. It, it's awesome. Uh, and I definitely agree, as you can see from the, um, from the like here uh, with, this, uh, with this statement. Um, two hours ago. Yeah, no, it's not actually two hours ago, but it was two hours ago when I made this talk. Anyway, uh, so we're going to talk about uh, tooling. So the name is Mathieu, if you haven't met me before, I work at Paradox Development Studio where I make a great game called Stellaris, which is a 4x exploration uh, and I remember what the three over x's are, but basically you play in space and it's super cool, you should try it. Uh, you can reach me at all those uh, different uh, things, I have none of them as the same user as you can see, this is, this is our social media. Anyway, what are we going to talk about today? So, uh, obviously we're going to talk about tooling. I mean, you probably got that from the title. Uh, we're going to talk about quality, but more than quality, we're going to talk about enforcing quality. Keeping the level of quality the same. Not basically going worse. Uh, but then, I mean, keeping as good as you are is only one part of the problem, right? You also want to probably raise it from wherever it is, because if, if, if the bar is really low, well, you can keep it there, but that's probably not the objective you have, right? You probably want to upgrade it too. And We'll focus on automation because, again, we programmers were lazy. We like to have somebody else do our job but still get paid. Uh, and also, I mean, um, this is the first, the first part is going to be for your manager because at some point you're going to have to make a case for it. Because, I mean, that's the first thing he's going to ask. Like, well, that sounds nice, but how much is it going to cost me? So this is basically what we're going to talk in the first part. Because I, I don't, like, I mean... I thought about this very hard when I made this. I was like, yeah, obviously we're gonna, we, you want this because of quality. And then I remember this talk I had with a manager of mine a couple of times, I don't know exactly, a couple of years ago maybe. And he was like, oh, you engineers, you just want quality for quality's sake. That's an engineering thing. Like, yeah, you know, we, we're nerds. We just want quality for quality's sake. There is like, this is the only reason we want it. This is not really true, or, or so I hope. Uh, there's actual reasons why we want quality. It's just not because we're being very pedantic. Uh, there's actual reasons, and that's, that's what I try to, uh, to think about. So, what are the words that come to mind? Like, okay, let's, you're my audience, that's perfect. Uh, uh, you have totally not seen my, uh, my, my, my Twitter question before, or maybe you have if you follow me. What comes to mind if you think quality? I say like, oh, this code base is quality. What, what do you expect? Few bucks. Few bucks, yeah, that's, that's a good one. Well Actually, I, I call it robustness. It's, yeah, it's robust. You know what? It's tested. It works. It actually does what it's supposed to do. That's one. Able to be changed. Oh, did you see those slides before or what? <laughs> we have absolutely not coordinated before, just so you know. Okay, uh, you, you can get a guess that there's at least two more bullet points. So what, what, what else is going to come in your, in your mind? Cute. Cute? <laughs> That's an interesting one. That's not the first one I would have thought about, but... Uh, <laughs> what? Readable. Readable. Oh, almost. I put ease of use. Like, yeah. So basically, yes, it's robust, it's maintainable, it's easy to use. And since your manager is maybe in the room, it's also cost, you know, because I mean, we were talking about it. Yeah. Okay. We get all that stuff, but how much is it going to cost me? So let's talk about this thing. So robustness, of course, we mean bug free, but not only. Uh, we also think about other stuff like portability. You don't have to be 100% portable with platforms you will never ship for, but you have to be reasonably portable. Uh, like, probably try to not abuse too much the own my machine it works thing, uh, not rely on undefined behavior and that kind of stuff. 
Because, I mean, software changes and maybe at some point you will have to move to 64 bits like I did in three different projects or uh, you will have to go on another operating system or you will just get a new version of the compiler and if it actually works because you're relying on implementation if it defines stuff, you may have some issues. Um, Unix test coverage is also a thing. I mean, I don't even know how you guarantee robustness without Unix test coverage. You can probably manual test, but it has some limits. And error handling. This is probably the one that uh, was suggested the less or that I hear the less uh, when people think about robust code. It's how well do you handle errors? Not only like you actually handle them, which is <laughs> like a first, uh, but the second one is like you, you tell either the, the programmer or the user which might be a programmer, what happened and what can he do, uh, what can he do about it. Uh, I make video games, right? So we, I think a lot about UX and I think I know people hate when you got, just get a pop-up saying error. That doesn't help anybody. So yeah, I think error handling is probably the, the one that is uh, thought, less the, thought the less when we, when we talk about quality. When we talk about maintainability, it usually goes hand in hand, I think, with simplicity, right? Like the simplest code is the easiest to, uh, to maintain because it's like, so dumb, you can't, you can't, it's foolproof, you can't, you can't, you, you can't, you can't, you can't mess it. Uh, expressiveness also comes together, like, if your code is expressive, it's easier for people who get into it to get the intent of what you're doing and say, oh, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense, or, oh yeah, sure, it's doing that, sure, oh yeah, okay, I get it. If it's sophisticated with, like, basically, uh, like, a huge blocks with if and continues and force and other block and then a go-to, maybe, uh, it's going to be much harder to maintain. Uh, it might work, but the minute someone tries to change something, it's going to run into a world of pain. Uh, use of common idioms. Uh, we hire people from time to time, uh, or we move companies. And uh, I mean, the only shared knowledge we really have is stuff that is already used somewhere else. And that's, that's uh, cognitive uh, load, basically. The less I have to learn, the better, right? I, um, my previous company had these interesting idioms that uh, they didn't believe in new and delete or alloc and free. Everything was called open and close. And the first, the first time I, I, I saw the idea of opening and closing an array, I was very confused. Like, how do you open an array like that? Like a socket, I would have understood. A file, I would have understood. But an array? How do you open it? How do you close it? So many questions. Well, that's less questions if you use something common. And usually we think about like either design patterns you already know about, but also vocabulary types. Are, you don't have to use DSTL if you don't like to, and see my other talk, but you, uh, you can still have an interface that looks like it enough so that people are not confused. Uh, and of course, clean architecture is usually also a big, big plus for maintainability. Uh, the minute you start wanting to, uh, to change stuff, uh, if, if you have circular dependencies or just <coughs> eh, kind of messy architectures, you will run into um, well, many problems. Ease of use, of course, like, again, quality code. You want, uh, you want, a, you, you want a, a good, you want a good API design. You want an API that is, uh, I think it's Scott Mayer who said, like, make it easy to use and very hard to misuse. I'm not sure it's Scott Mayer's actually. Uh, work from home, uh, if, you, if you can tell me. But yeah, make the thing easy to use uh, and very hard to uh, use the wrong way. Uh, that, that's, 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 I think, something we, we, we have in some parts of the STL, maybe not so less uh, in, in others, but some things are very straightforward. You just, you will really have to want to, uh, to mess it up. Like, if, if you don't try explicitly to mess it up, it will probably do what you expect. Documentation comes with that. Uh, doesn't have to be like actual uh, physical documentation or just like uh, readme or... There is a lot of way of doing documentation, but at least some documentation, at least even a comment saying, this is my precondition, this is my postcondition. I expect this pointer to not be null. I expect you to give me only positive integers, that kind of stuff. Uh, because again, if, if not, you create assumptions and then it's not easy to use because if you rely on assumptions, yeah, you, may, you may have problems. And genericity, because again, you want to reuse it and the more generic it is, the easier it is to reuse that. That's why we usually like, like stuff like templates, algorithms and all that stuff because it's reusable in other cases. Okay, so, so far I talked about stuff that most p people in the room... Okay, you're not going to tell me. Is it the kind of stuff you want to see? Are, you, are, you, are, we, are we clear on the idea that sounds like quality stuff? That sounds like something I want in my code base. Yeah? Well, I see people like, yeah, yeah, we should do that. Um, that's cool. But then your manager comes. It's like, okay, cost. 
Because, I mean, you, you, you talk about all that things and the first question is going to have a guess, but can you do this for free? Like, it's going to cost something, right? I mean, if I had, if I had to choose for bad to good code and, and both of them would cost the same thing, I would only have good code. So obviously, it must cost something. And I mean, sure, it is. Like, you might have development time overhead because I guess it takes more time to think than to not think. Um, and then we run into the ideas of technical depth uh, because actually you, um, you have something that technical depth is a form of cost. Is you don't want to pay something and then it keeps creeping. Possibly less than if you actually did the investment, but it's still, it's still a cost that, that's lying somewhere. It's the fact that every time you try to add more stuff to your code base, it just costs you and costs you. Even if at the time it was cheap to make. And then, of course, we tie all that to the big old idea of return of investment. It's like, sure, you can give me quality, but how do I get my money back as, a, as, as, as someone who's actually like paying your salary or if you own your own company as someone who's just like funding the project? How am I getting the, my money back? Because quality is great, but what do I get out of it? Is it, is it worth it? And you know, that's the, the base quality. Is quality worth the cost? Uh, I'm not going to say yes or no, because that's not really a yes, no question. Like, it, it, there is a gradient to everything, right? Like the, the more you put into quality, maybe the less you'll get, maybe not. That's, that's a question I think we, sh we, we, we need to explore before we go on. Um, I have my opinions, but let's, let's see where it leads. So the thing when we enter the debate of cost versus benefits for quality is that actually it's kind of bizarre because some parts is actually easy or easy to measure. For the cost of quality, if you ask your manager, it's going to be very easy to measure. It's like, okay, extra developer time. That's fine. That's something you can understand. It will pull up an Excel sheet and multiply every Monday by one point something. 1.2, 1 1.3, 2, 3, 4 times. I don't know. But it's something you can easily measure. It's overhead. It's going to cost me more Mondays to get anything done. Okay, that's easy. Resource investment. Same thing. I need to buy servers. I need to buy licenses. I need to buy hardware. Like, ah, okay, it's easy. It's just, I can put a number on this. Like, I, I buy X machines, multiply, blah, 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 blah. The accounting on all that stuff is fairly straightforward. There's still a figure of, uh, like it's not precise science, but you can get a pretty decent ballpark number. Benefits on the other hand, how do you put a price on quality? Like on how much you gain from it? Like, okay, let's say from now on we focus on portability. And before we didn't, how, how, much, how much money do I get? Like. You, I can, I can quantify man hours and, and make a multiplication by the cost I'm paying my guys and, and get an idea of how much I'm going to pay. How, how do I know if it's actually worth it? Because that's the thing, like, how do you evaluate future time not spent? Because that's usually that, right? Like, you have quality because in the future, your stuff will not be costier to, to maintain or even maybe, maybe cheaper to maintain. Uh, you won't have to spend as much time on bug fixing or on uh, debugging stuff. But that's... That's money I won't have to spend. How do I quantify money I won't have to spend? It's like selling insurance. It's a whole job. Like there are people paid reasonable amount of money to make mathematical models that tell you how much should an insurance cost depending on how much you get. And then you start getting into probabilities. <sighs> I'm not a math person. I, I have no idea how to compute that. I don't know if anyone in the room does. That's, that's great for you. But I don't think I do. And I'm not sure my manager wants to bother with that either. And also potential damages over to that's really the insurance part because like yeah how much would it cost me if there was a critical bug in my application and I get like I don't know a big crash uh, like I mean the, 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 the worst example is like my uh, like the, the people who cut some cost on Arian the fourth and then we use the code on Arian the fifth and then it blew up like how, how do you manage the fact that maybe by skipping some costs now we might lose a rocket in 10 years how do you even compute that or you get a data breach or whatever else. It's very hard to compute. And I think that's the biggest problem when you try to argue quality with someone. Is that one of them is easy to measure, the other one, uh, it's very intangible, it's just an ID. But there are actual arguments you can make that are much more uh, concise. And um, The first one is, okay, who here, uh, oh, let's, let, let, let's, not, let's not spoil it. Okay, here is the thing. You, you, you can disagree with me, but I really think that regardless of quality, companies view the code you write as an investment. And what I mean by that is that if you go to your boss and say, okay, we ship the server, uh, the service, I can throw away all the code now. What is the first thing he's going to say? Like, what? No, are you crazy? No, we spent so much money developing that. Of course, we're going to reuse it. Like, 
we're going to make more features or maybe we're going to make a sequel or uh, maybe we're going to do something else. Like, I want to try with you. Let's, let's try something. How many projects did you start or join? Try just to think about the number in your head, okay? Do you get an idea? How many projects you started by your own or just joined during your career? Okay, fine. How many of those were killed? Like, oh, not in production today, nobody developing them anymore. Is that more than zero? Good. How many of those have never been reused in any other project either? Does anyone have a non-zero value? Oh, two, three people in the room. Right. Mm -hmm. As far as I know. As far as you know, yeah. <laughs> you left the company, maybe. <laughs> so, yeah, and I think that's the biggest idea. Like, um, there was a very great talk about this, sadly it's in France, uh, when someone was saying, basically, accounting views of my, of my code has, has, has destroyed the IT model. And the argument he was making is that your software has paid dividends at the moment you shipped, you shipped it. You, you got a contract, you got clients, it's... It's paid off. You should not look at it like someone looks at a piece of furniture we bought and say, oh no, we have to amortize this in five years. Like the accounting thing they teach you when you start taking accounting classes. Every time you buy something, there is something called amortization. You say, okay, every year I'm going to devaluate the value uh, on my, uh, on my uh, company uh, assets and at some point it will be zero. And when it's zero, I can safely throw it away because it's been properly uh, amortized in accounting. <laughs> They never do, they kind of do that in software, if, even if, but they not always decide to go to zero. It might, you know, go down and down, but not really. And, and I think that's the big problem. Because here's the thing, code always lives longer than projected. A couple of times I tried, like I was maybe younger and I thought, okay, I have a very tough decision to make. I can take a shortcut or I might not take a shortcut, but I know one of them is going to cost more. So I'm going to ask my boss, how long is this project going to last? Because then I can actually make a cost versus benefit ratio. But whatever number I got was never the right result, right? Like, if it was honest, he said, I don't know. If it was not, he would say, I don't know, three months and then we'll never use it again. Yeah, no, that's not going to happen. Like, unless your company goes under or uh, something terrible happens, most of your code is going to live longer than you projected. And then it, it brings the question, right? Uh, it's not that expensive to get quality. Uh, I mean, it is, but not as much as you might think. Uh, one of the big reasons is automation, and that's what we're going to talk about for the rest of this talk. Uh, a lot of quality uh, checks and, uh, and, and guarantees and other stuff like that can, can be attained at a very reasonable cost. And more importantly, especially when we get to the automation parts uh, that, that helps you making your code better, it's done by CPUs, it's done by machines. And if there is one thing automation has taught us is that machines are much cheaper than humans. And this is the, for the, the, the exact reason why we have those jobs. It's because someone figured out that it's cheaper to pay someone to make a program and then run the program than have people do the thing manually every time. And that's the exact same thing with code. So here is the thing. In my opinion, and feel free to disagree with me in this talk or after the talk and, and tell me I'm wrong. But here is a case I, I think you can make for quality is that whether you like it or not, whether you admit it or not, your code will be seen as an investment by your company. And if I have to pick between a bad code and a good code, I think one of them is a better investment. And then how much you have to put on that investment? Well, with tooling, I think it can be reasonable. So let's see what we can do with that. I call this section by bare bones. The reason it's called bare bones is, well, because it's the bare bones. It's all the stuff that I think every project should have. But also, it might sound dumb, but over the past couple of years, I maybe worked on three or four different projects in different companies. None of them have had all of this at the time when I joined them. And I'm not sure all of them have all of them. Uh, sorry, I'm not sure all of those programs have all of those projects have all of those things in them. So we'll play a game, okay? We'll, uh, we'll check them and we'll see with the room it does everybody had everything. And then, and then you will tell me if, it's, if I'm really speaking about stuff that is so obvious that everybody has it, because I'm pretty sure it's not. <sighs> it's me. Of course, we're going to talk some build. But don't worry, there's like two slides. So step zero is a reproducible build. A rep oh, God, that word. Reproducible build. You need one. I know you don't want to talk about build. I know, because I talk about build and nobody else wants to. Uh, 
but you need to, and here's why. The idea is that you have two developers, it, it scales to more than two, but we have three quantities in computer science, right? Like one, two, and many, or no, zero, one, and many. So two is many. You have at least two people, and they both uh, pull the same sources, same version, same commit, same revision, whatever you use, same physical copy if you don't use SCMs. I didn't put SCMs, I just assume you use that, that I, I don't go that bad. Uh, and then they call build, both of them. And then they should get the exact same program, or the exact same error message. If one of them gets a program and the other one gets a compiler, or you, have not, or you don't have a reproducible build. If two people get a program, but they differ, and they differ in the code, like in the binary generated in ways that they basically don't behave the same, or if they don't get the same error message, but they both get an error message, you don't have a reproducible build. build. What? You don't mean bit, bit by, by byte equal, I mean like behave the same. I mean, up to some extent, Probably. I mean, you may have timestamps and a bunch of other stuff in your code, but except timestamps and other things that like observable stuff should be the same. Like uh, your behavior should be exactly the same. You shouldn't have one that, that says one and the other one that says two uh, when you put the same input into it, unless you're actually testing a random number generator. But then how do you? Uh, that's, that's a little tricky question. Yeah. So basically the idea is I build the same program twice uh, on the same machine or I build the same program once on two different machines uh, with the same source, with the same tool chain, blah, blah, blah. I get the exact same result because we're here to talk about automation. And how do you do automation if it's not reproducible? What do you do when you get false positives? You start distrusting the system. And if you can't trust it, you can't use it. And that's as simple as that. If you have false positives in your build, then whole automation is out of the window. That's, that's why it's step zero, and that's the first thing you should address. If you don't have a producible build, well, every automation you put there, eh, it says green, but is it really? I don't know. I remember last week, it said green, and then it actually didn't build. Or it said red, and it was actually fine. But on my machine, it worked. That doesn't work. You don't have to go full, very complex build system. You don't even have to uh, let me talk to you about CMake. It can just be like build.sh and gcc star uh, dash o. Like, I don't care. The important part is I run this script and I ever get the same mess error message or I get the same program at the end. If I don't get that, I don't have a reproducible build and then I cannot automate anything. Uh, if you have tests, I mean, obviously you should have tests, right? Uh, the, the, the build comment should probably also build the test and run them. And the same way your, uh, your build is, uh, is, no, is reproducible, your test should be reproducible. If I, if I run the same time to test twice, they should both pass or both fail for the same test and the same reason. If I run them on two machines, same story. Again, it's about making sure you don't have false positives because then you start distrusting the system and you cannot automate it. So yeah, if you want to walk out of this room with one thing and then disregard everything else I say, maybe remember just this. Randomness is the nemesis of automation. If you have randomness, automation will just fail. Step one. Yeah, zero was built. I'm a programmer. I started zero. Uh, or maybe it was because you need that to go the right. Anyway, automated formatting. Who here likes to argue about formatting? Yeah, we programmers. We like to argue way too many. You know what? I think whatever the reason, the response I get to this question, I push my points both ways, right? Either, either you care way too much or you don't care at all. But in, in both cases, it's going to be terrible. Uh, because, I mean, I don't know about you, but to me, manual formatting is a waste of time. And the only thing that is worse is debating formatting. I think I've been in three code standard initiatives so far that I failed because some people started argues tabs versus spaces versus braces on the next line. Like, I don't care. I don't care as long as Clang format can format it. Just give me the Clang format file and I will do whatever I have to do. I will put some plug in my ID or I would put a git comic hook and it will just do it. There are several reasons why you want to do that. Uh, I guess the biggest one is that you're going to have, uh, we're going to have to start doing some more advanced automation down the line. And that won't work if you can't format it because humans can format, but robots, they need rules to format. They can't just read your uh, Google Doc code standard and format with it. It's not going to work. Uh, also, I think devs are much more readable if you actually only care about uh, that because you can just ignore the white space changes. Where should it happen? Should it be a, a pre-commit thing? I mean, you can do whatever you want. I, I, I don't even have an opinion on this. I mean, I have several opinions, but 
whatever works as long as everything you commit is formatted using the code sta the, the formatting standard you saved. Uh, and it could be the standard, the default one from, uh, from Clang or one of the five or six styles it comes with, or it could be your custom one. I don't really care as long as there's one. Um, most IDs have plugins. I think I say most because I don't know all IDs. Uh, but yeah, all IDs as, as a plugin that on save or on demand can apply Clang format on the whole file. And then you can have a pre-commit hook on Git, on Git if you really want to be sure that everything that you commit is formatted. It just has to be. Yeah, because if you don't have that, then somebody will not do it, and then you don't want it saved. Then you make a small change, and the whole file changes, and then you get it. Right. So here's the thing: the first time you move to formatting, if you did not have it before. Yes, you must f have every file. And some people will argue, oh, but no, it's going to break my, uh, my history and I will never be able to do git blame for the rest of my life. Well, this is not true anymore and it's been some time now. Git has a great common uh, argument that says ignore refs file, which is just every time you make a white space change to your code base that, like, you ch and you apply Clang format everywhere, you just make it. You make only that changes in the comments, only that and nothing else. I mean, and that in submitting the new Clang format file. And then you note down that, uh, that Clang format, that, uh, that commit ID, and you write it, uh, you, you push it on the next commit in Git. And then you say, every time you do Git blame, you can tell Git, ignore that commit, it's white space. I don't care about it. Because, sure, I've done it in the past. I've done Clang format everywhere. And, and, and then some very uh, basic people at QA put every bug on me. Because every time they did git blame, that was my line that was changed. That was great. I got all the tickets from the department. That was fun. But yeah, well, you just do that, and then it doesn't happen anymore. Because it goes through, and it doesn't exist. It's, it's as if git did not see it. You can, still, you can still not pass the arguments if really you have a doubt that your two formatter has made a bug. But 99% of the time he wants, and you can just ignore that entirely, and the argument goes out of the window. And every time you change the style, you just add one more, one, one, one thing to the ref style, and it's just as if it never happened. Step two, merge requests. Who here is not using merge requests? It's fine. I understand you. When I joined my company, we were not using merge requests either. Why, why are merge requests great? Code reviews. Yes, but not exactly. Because I, I could do code reviews after the fact. Sure. Yep. I haven't made statistics, so I will make this claim uh, kind of out of my ass, but I'm pretty sure it's right. It's like, any review of comments you made after the commit was merged into whatever integration branch it needs to be, as, I don't know, 10% chance maybe of being acted upon. Because, you know, it's merged. You can close the Jira. It's like documentation. You will do it later. <laughs> yeah, I used to have a workflow that was, yeah, no, uh, we, you merge first, and then you, uh, like every week or something, you're supposed to look at the history, and you just check the comments and make comments. Oh, I made tons of comments. But you know the good thing about comments? They're ignored when you compile. Well, that's the exact same thing with this. You can just ignore them. So basically the idea is that no change should be merged unless someone has reviewed and approved it <coughs> end of the line and how do you do that you do that with pull requests because with pull requests you force contributors to address your concern or not be able to close their jira or whatever tracking bug system you use if they cannot close their task because they have not addressed your comment well they will actually address your comment because that's the only way they get anything through the door if you say no 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 you can address them later i mean how willing are you to take that chance? Uh, if, maybe if you trust them, you know where they live, yeah, maybe you can. But uh, yeah, I wouldn't take it. No, I would lock the integration branch. Every uh, GitLab, Git blah blah, GitLab, GitDub, Git whatever, they all have this. You lock, nobody is right. Nobody can do anything on that branch. Even the tech lead, nope, can't. nobody. Even the CEO, nobody can push, nobody. But they can do merge requests but only if someone has actually approved them. And then you can change the code. And that's the only way in. Because again, we're going to do quality. And the only way to a certain quality is that everything is up to the standard. If there is a shortcut, and then there is a way. And you know, people take the path of least resistance because that's human. You have a deadline, you want to go home. I've done it. I'm not proud of it, but I've done it. And I've said like, ah, but it's just me, it's fine. Ah, I know what I'm doing. 
or I just needed to go home. Ah, we are super good at making excuses for ourselves. And it's, it's normal. That psychology has a lot of articles about that. It's, it's, it, we need someone else to keep us in check, basically. And that's the thing. And also, uh, reviewers are not limited to humans. You can have robots reviewing you. And we're going to have some robots reviewing ourselves. I work in sci-fi, and I see you have it up. Um, and we're going to see that. But first, we need continuous integration. Um, who else? Who here has a CI? Ah, I'm starting to lose hands. Interesting. I should have done this for every step. All right. So the idea is that your reference branch, your integration branch, your master, your develop, your whatever you call it, should always build and pass the tests. That's, that's the basic idea. Because that's how you are certain quality. You make sure that nothing that gets merged is actually bad. And the first step of not being bad is probably compiling. The second step is passing the tests. The third step is passing reviews. Reviews, we can certain that with the previous steps, uh, which was merge request. Now we need to make sure it actually builds and it actually uh, passed the tests. So how do we do it? It's easy. You remember that uh, script we made on step zero that had to be always uh, right or wrong, but never kind of right, but kind of wrong? Well, that's why we have it. Because then we can just uh, make sure that uh, every time uh, something is pushed on the master branch or on the whatever branch, the bot runs. And then it tells everybody, oh, stop whatever you're doing. It should not be read. And actually, we can take that a step further and say, you know what? My robot can run on any merge request. Because what's a merge request? It's the sum of whatever we have plus whatever you want to add, which is usually exactly what you will end up with if you click that merge button. Unless you're not using fast forward and, uh, but I mean, that's semantics. We can argue about them later. But the biggest idea is like, okay, now we have a second review where there's also mandatory pull request and it's a robot. And until the robot is happy, you're not merging. Because if the robot is unhappy, well, it probably has a good reason to be unhappy because it's a very, very dumb and very, very stupid script that just says yes or no. And he only says no when you have something critical, like your code not building. And that's very simple. And that way, again, you can't just go home and say, oh, I, I, you know, I don't pass the test, but it's fine. Or you don't have like, oh, who broke the build? Oh, it's it's it's, uh, it's John, but he went on vacation. Sorry, let's fix the build. I'm away. All my mails are redirected to the trash. And we're done with the basics. Who has all the basics? Hey, I still have some people. Cool. Um, there is a few issues when you start doing that, so I will uh, try to address them real quick. <sighs> the first one is randomness. Did I talk about randomness yet? Okay, if you have randomness, you have problems. The most classic one is the build bot sometimes is red, but it's not actually red. You know what happens when you do that? You, may, you start making it optional, because you might be, have to override them. Because, you know, sometimes he says it's failed, but it doesn't really fail. So you're like, ah, ignore the bot, he's wrong, merge. And the longer you do that, the longer someone will say, you know what, maybe I don't have to wait for the build to the, the bot to build. I mean, it's gonna, it's gonna half the time, it's just gonna give me technical errors anyway. And people don't like to waste time. They hate wasting time on, on bad automation, even worse than they, uh, than they like uh, wasting time with no automation. Like bad automation is even worse than automation. So if you want to do it, and again, we're doing quality, you have to make it right. So randomness, again, it's a problem. You may have some, I mean, I'm not, I, I, you, you have like, you can have like a, I don't know, like if one every thousand build has a technical issue because your servers are out of space. I mean, it's not great. You can try to have something that is good enough to be able to recoup from that. But I mean, it's not the end of the world. If like half your build failed for random reasons or even 10%, right, then you have a problem. Uh, another, another problem that people usually break up, uh, bring up when I uh, talk about this is uh, build job duration. The fact that, oh, but I have to wait for the build job to uh, compile and test all my code before I can merge. Well, first question I have is like, how, 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 how in a hurry are you for, to get your code to merge? Like, does it have to be like in five minutes? Can't you wait an hour? I mean, maybe in some cases you have a merge request that cannot wait an hour. But most of the time you will also need, I mean, all the time, you will need a human reviewer or two. And I hope you don't run to your colleagues every time you push a merge saying, no, 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 stop whatever you're doing. Review my code now. I mean, I don't know about you, but I just opened the merge request like a couple times a day, a day like maybe two, three. And I say, oh, there's something I could review now because I have nothing else to do. And then I review code. Chances are the bot is done anyway at this point because it's been an hour. 
If your bot takes 12 hours, then yes, that might become a problem for your workflow. And then you might have to, uh, other issues. Maybe you need to split the project. You probably need to improve your build uh, process. But I mean, then again, if your build job takes 12, 12 hours, how long does your local build take? There's a huge chance it's going to be the same issue and means you can't iterate either. So I understand the arguments, but I think it's probably overused for what it actually is. Because again, I don't think you should rush on a code review on a merge request unless everything is on fire. But then again, the more quality you have, the less chances something is going to be on fire anyway. And we can always argue about exceptional uh, measures for exceptional cases, right? We can always make small exceptions. Maybe your tech lead in very small condition could be allowed to touch directly the master branch, blah, blah, blah. But again, exceptions. Oh, and randomness is also bad. Okay. Let's get something a bit more advanced so that everybody in the room gets something. Um, so the first thing you're going to do is talk about build because, again, me. Because um, here is the thing. Uh, all the tools I showed up to there are very simple. Uh, Clang format, for example, does not need to be able to parse your code. Uh, like it, it works on the tokenizer. It doesn't actually need to, uh, to, 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 to do the AST parsing and all that stuff. Uh, more advanced tools need to see as much as your compiler does. It needs to be able to read all your code the same way your compiler would do. It needs to have the right include paths. It needs to have the right defines. It needs to have everything the same way as if you were compiling. Because else it's not reasoning on the same code. It has to, because of defines and a bunch of uh, if def and a bunch of other stuff. Which basically means every time he wants to analyze a file with some like advanced tools, you need to get the full compile command to compile it. Uh, there are several ways you can communicate that to a tool. The most common one is the LLVM compiler database, compilation database. And I think it's probably based to the fact that a lot of people use Clang-based tooling, which is great, and probably the rest of, uh, of the content of this first section. The good news is if you use CMake, it's one line. You had minus D CMake export compile commands to your uh, when you run CMake, and it just generate that file for you. And I've yet to see it fail, even with the ugliest uh, build I've seen in CMake. And trust me, people send me CMake lists sometimes. It works. It's just like it should work. If you're running an exotic build system or a custom build system because you wrote your own, because it's fun and whatever, then you need to bake that support in. Um, that, was a, that was a problem in a previous job of mine. Uh, they, we made their own build system and one day I said, hey, I, since we switched to that thing, I can't do any automation anymore because I can't get the compilation database. That's, that's not cool because you need it. Uh, so yes, if it's CMake, it's easy. If it's not, the best option I found was bear, which is a magic Unix command that you, uh, you call on top of your build. And it would try to intercept every syscall to a fork, basically, an exec, and try to say, oh, you're trying to run GCC. Let me recall that you're going to compile this file. It's kind of hacky. It's basically recording everything you do when you run make. And from that, it tries to infer what is your build command. It's not super, it's, it kind of works, but it also doesn't work if you build on Visual Studio and other issues like that. So, I mean, your best bet is CMake or some tool that actually supports LLVM. I think Bazel has one, but I don't know about the other ones. Some of them do. Because we're going to do static analysis next. Who here uses a static analyzer? Okay, who, who is not using Clunk Tidy of this one? Oh, I think one, pe one person, two person, oh, three person. What are you using? Lint. Lint. Like, oh, okay. Like the original lint? No, it's no, a... PCP. Oh, I don't think I used that one. Oh, I used PCPP check. I had so many false positives. But your mileage may vary. I, I mean, I, Clang is going to be used for the rest of this exploration. But if you find one that works for you, just it's fine. It's good. I'm not going to say don't use it. Go ahead. Uh, I just figured out that CPP check was too slow usually uh, compared to uh, Clang Tidy, but then again, that's that's my uh, that's my uh, that's my idea. So C++ is a static list type language. I, I say strongly, but I know some Haskell people are going to disagree with me. Um, semantically, it's not strong, but also compared to C or JavaScript, uh, your mileage may vary. But the idea is that the compiler can reason a lot about the logic of your code, right? And that's why the optimizer is so good. It's because it can blaze through a lot of uh, 
type in direction and all that stuff and say, yeah, okay, I see what you mean, but I can also conflate all that tree into one very simple thing. Well, the same way, if you give the same kind of tool more time and more exploratory algorithm, they can figure out a lot of stuff. And that's basically how static analyzers work. So it's more than bug checking. Bug checking is the first thing they can tell you, but it's not only that. Uh, for example, if you look at the client ID checks, they have a lot of code standard conformance. Like Google says, don't use this, use that. Uh, I think LLVM, Mozilla, and a bunch of others have uh, contributed their own checks to client ID. And the whole idea is the same. It's like, our company has a code standard that says you should use those patterns and not those patterns. You can have a, a tool that tells people, oh, you're breaking the code standard there. And fix it, or you're not going to merge. Uh, you can suggest better, uh, better idioms. Uh, we're going to talk about modernizing in the next section, but that's the big classic. Like, oh, maybe you should use auto there. Or have you heard about this thing called Rye? Uh, or uh, range for a bunch of other stuff like that. And there's also a few checks that can actually find suboptimal bits of codes. Uh, the classic one I see is usually a uh, missed opportunity for move. Like the places where you should just have stood move, but you did not. And then you're going to anchor a copy where you could just not do it. The compile, again, a lot of those things look like what you could get with uh, W, all the warnings of Earth. But uh, I think to some extent, uh, compiler developers restrain themselves of how many warnings they put, especially if it requires deep analysis of, uh, of, of the call stack or uh, of, because, I mean, people complain a lot about compilation time already. So better put those checks in, 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 a, in a dedicated tool that you can use afterwards. So yeah, I mean, again, Clang Tidy is my recommendation. Uh, if you find another one, great for you. Clang Tidy has like 100 configurable checks, at least. Uh, and also the big thing it has, it can suggest patches. Uh, it can say, yeah, you know what? Your code is not great here, but here is what you could do. Here is a patch. Just, just put it to patch and then you're done. Uh, and also since it's Clang, it's super modular and you can extend it. And as we will see next, it's interesting. You can do a lot of stuff with that. How do you get, how do you get from, uh, from no static analysis to static analysis? Because that, that's one of the things I hear sometimes. Like, oh yeah, that sounds super cool, but my code base has probably a billion uh, violations of all those. How do I do it? And I would say it's the exact same way you add warnings to your compiler that you did not use before. You check out a branch, you add the warning, or you add the check on, uh, on, uh, on your static analyzer, you run it. You fix all the errors. When all the errors are fixed, yay, you can merge. And then every new code will run with that flag and then we'll check for it and it won't get merged unless it fixes. <coughs> and you just repeat the process until you have enough. And since the idea is that quality can be iterative, you will probably never have enough. You will always find, oh, there is this new check that we could introduce next. Just my recommendation is do it step by step. Don't try to put like clank tidy minus everything. Because, yeah, you're going to have like so many errors, your terminal might crash or something. Like, no, don't do that. Um, but pick a select ones. Fix, go again. Like you don't go from no warning to minus to minus wall minus W error in, in one go. Like that, that's just insane. You go, you go step by step. And again, like I said, uh, and that's the next section. Uh, you don't always have to do it yourself. Again, we want to automate, and that's that's where the big part comes in, and that's where the automation part of automation comes. Because, like automate automation of compilation, autom like pull requests, that's that's arguably some form of automation. But here is the here is to me the big game changer, is that a lot of refactoring is actually quite systematic. I mean, it's supposed to be systematic. That's the point, right? You replace pattern A by pattern B. So you might start with like uh, control H, like search and replace. In, some, in, in, in simple cases, it works. And then you start getting creative and say, you know what? I think with a regex, I could match everything. Maybe. Usually you start being unable to read the regex before it actually does everything you want. Or oh, at least that's my, uh, that's my, uh, that, that's my usage. Like I, I can write the regex, but I basically debugging the regex as I write it. And once it's executed, there is no way I can read it again. Uh, so, yeah. And the big thing we can do instead is AST matching. Uh, for I have not explained it before, but AST is abstract syntax tree. Uh, it's the tree representation of your program, basically as seen by the compiler. And uh, and, and and the big idea is that with that we can uh, we can start doing uh, queries on your code and then basically replacements. For example, uh, one of the things you could do is say, okay, uh, I want to find all the functions uh, in my code that uh, take an argument. Uh, that is passed by constref that they got from their signature and then store them in an internal uh, class variable. Like you, you take like a string by constref and you 
copy it basically, let's make a copy. And since C11, we know that it's suboptimal. You should take them by refref and you should start move them. The reason is if you get called by a temporary, you save one, you save one copy. If you get called by something that was about to be destroyed, someone can just pass it to you and again, you save the copy. And I mean, it's, it's for string, it's for vectors, for anything that is kind of heavy to move. That would be very painful to do manually. I don't even know how I would do that with regexes. I mean, it might be possible if you have like a very, very good naming pattern that can detect like stuff, but no. The solution is like, oh, hey, Clang, don't you have something that says, yeah, you should modernize your code and pass by value when you can. And then you just do that. And then Clang will just emit patches that you just have to, uh, to, to put in your code base and then, and then you're done. There's a lot of them. Uh, in modernize. Uh, I've used them several times. Uh, historically, a lot of migration from uh, after I migrated from uh, 0 0.03 to 11, but also when I was wanting to migrate from uh, 11 to 04 to 14 or 17. Uh, for example, you can replace all the news by make Unix because naked new is bad, but sadly C11 missed, missed make Unix for some reason. It was missed and it only ended up in 14. So the day you end up 14, you can just say, hey, you know what? Remove all those. Uh, new expression ugly thing that you do you can just make make unique everywhere it's just cleaner uh, you can force auto and range for everywhere that it makes sense uh, when you start migrating to 14 and 17 you want to get rid of the auto pointer you might have a new code base um, the good thing is that there is a check for that you might get uh, you won't get away with a control edge because you have to actually explicitly start movement now and clang can do that for you uh, you can remove a lot of code by saying, oh, you know what, you can just do a default value, equal default, equal delete, instead of whatever tricks we used in O3. Uh, that's another big one. And I think that's, I mean, that's not all of them. That's just like four or five of the, of the one I used. There's like 10 of them or something now, maybe more. They keep adding any more, more and more in, uh, uh, as time passes. <laughs> so yeah, basically the idea is that you can do a lot of things. You can remove deprecated stuff uh, to help you like migrate code. Uh, you can uh, adopt new patterns by replacing old constructs and old uh, old items by something more more recent and more modern. Uh, you can some cases find suboptimal code. It's probably the least one, uh, the, the least I uh, I used it for, but it's possible. There's a bunch of performance check in Clang Tidy that kind of do the trick. But the biggest thing is it's systematic. It's all across the code base. Well, I mean, I, oh, yeah, it is all across the code base. You just feed all the CPP file you have and it will just do it for all of them. You won't miss anything. Um, if you want an example, actually the thing is, it's only the starting point. Because, okay, sure, you can, I have done it, I have applied it to migrate code bases, but then I, I hit another problem, which says, sometimes there are patterns in my code that are not really like common idioms, but I know they're bad, I know I want to migrate them, but I don't know how. Like control H will not work, for example. What do I do? Uh, and the thing is, since it's based on Clang, you can write your own. You write a piece of C++ that basically acts as a, as a, as a matcher. You, you, match, you match three expressions, basically. And, we've, and then you can say, okay, for all the expression you matched, emit this code in replacement. And then it just generates a patch that you can apply. If you want an example, uh, uh, one I know, previous company of mine, uh, who remembers f writable strings? Anyone ever use that? Okay, back in the days, a uh, long time ago, uh, C compilers would uh, put uh, like uh, literal, uh, string literals in the, da in, in, in the data segments. You could, you could modify them. Quickly enough, someone realized it was a very bad idea and said, no, no, it should be in the text segment because obviously those things are const, right? You should not be able to modify a string literal because it's not supposed to be changed. Uh, but we already had code at the time. And instead of fixing it, because that means introducing some cons left and right, we just say, no, no, we just use dash f writable string somewhere. I don't know, it was in the 90s, I guess. Uh, and that, that, that helped for some time. Up until you say we're dropping f writable strings. You can't have it. You want to upgrade your compiler? You need to get rid of it. And then you look at your code, it's like, oh, this has been 15 years since we just continued adding more and more of that. And the funny thing about cons is it's viral, right? Like, it's not enough to just fair, figure out every place is when someone takes a string literal and make const in front because it passes to other APIs, which also did not care about const and took everything by uh, non-const ref and non-const pointer. 
So what do we do? Well, we take an expert from the company and we say, you fix this because we need to upgrade. He does that for about a couple of months. And then he goes to his manager and he's like, you put me on another project or oh, I'm, I'm out. I think we burned three programmers like that. Mm. The fourth one says, no way, I'm not going to burn like those three. I'm going to make, a, I'm going to study this thing and I'm going to make a bot that's just going to do it for me recursively. Like basically it starts as, at level zero, it has const everywhere and then it fixes the, uh, the irregularity all the way down the APIs. And that's the only way we could switch from, uh, I don't know, it was GCC free, I think. That's the only way we could upgrade from GCC free to uh, GCC four or five at the time. And that was, stocking us, that was uh, blocking us from moving to C++11 way into the 2010s because we were using a feature from an old GCC and there was no way we could get it anymore. I don't think we ever tried paying them for getting it. Hopefully we didn't. Anyway, we managed to do it and the reason we managed to do it at the time was because of, of that. Uh, without it, I don't, I don't know if we could have made it. I think we would have just stayed in C++ or free saying, ah, fuck it, I guess writable strings. Or we would have burned more programmers. I'm not sure we would even have achieved it. So yeah, the big idea is your code becomes a database. Like your code is data, right? Yeah, we, we usually say code is code and data is data. We're in two segments, that's obvious. But your code is actually a database because you can parse it. You can read it as a tree. And it's a tree and everything has types and everything like that. And once it gets a tree, well, it's, it becomes a database. And once it's a database, what's the thing you can do in the database? Well, you can query, of course. But you can insert, you can update, you can delete. And, and that just opens up another paradigm. It's like your code is data, and since it's data, you can basically run migration steps the same way you update your SQL database. Saying, find everything that looks like this and replace it like that. Or just simply tell me how many rows match this expression. This is things I should probably fix. And again, at a large scale. I heard something like Google invested so much into this that they have more bots than humans making comments on the code base at this point. They're basically run by robots. Robots are cool. I made a sci-fi game. So yeah, um, I think user-defined refactoring is really the next step. And this is where you, uh, you go from like cool tooling to really, oh, okay, we, we can actually take a significant uh, part of our tech depth and just chug it away by having uh, automated uh, 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 process just taking care of it for us. Like, I would say it's kind of a shortcut to pay back your tech debt. I'm not saying it's a good way. It's a, it's, I mean, some people might argue that it's an argument for tech debt, saying, yeah, you know what, you have bots to fix it now. I'm not sure it's actually a good one, but eh, whatever. In any case, you can also introduce breaking changes because one of the problems I also saw in a lot of code bases is that nobody thought it could actually fix, uh, like change an API entirely. And that's one of the big reasons, for example, uh, in C++, we refuse to deprecate stuff until we, uh, unless it takes a long time to change. Because there's always going to be people raising their hand and say, oh, I have 15,000 uses of auto pointer in my code. You can't deprecate it. I need that. And then you can say, here, here's a script, run it on your code base. And now you don't have an argument anymore. And now we can actually move forward. And, and now you don't have to have like an API with free overloads and have the arguments are in use, but you're still keeping them because, because you don't want to change the code base. With that kind of stuff, you can fix your project. And even better, if you publish a library and you're afraid your client will not accept a breaking change, you can say, hey, here's a, here's a client ID check I made. Just run it on your code base and you automatically upgrade. The same way you say, hey, run this on your DB, you will add the, the, the latest schema. It's exactly the same thing. Here is a migration script that goes with my breaking change. So you can actually continue working. And like I said, cleaning old code becomes much cheaper. Again, not an argument for having that debt. Uh, I don't know how long am I on time, but this is the last part, so it's perfect. So right, if you have to rem uh, remember like, I don't know, three or four things. The first one is that quality is worth the cost, because, the cost, sorry, because Whatever you think, your code is going to be seen as an investment. So invest in a good investment. <laughs> you can use tooling to save world your quality, which is the first step, making sure that nothing gets worse. And the second step, which is more about automation, is raising the quality level and also raising it by using automation, not just manually spending like three weeks of uh, 
tech debt uh, just like removing auto pointers by hand because that's that first of all you're never going to get the budget and two yeah you know yeah, like i said you burn programmers doing that because we hate doing stuff that can be repeated <sighs> it opens new horizon it's not just like you can do stuff uh easily so you can just do stuff that were basically impossible before like i am not sure we have seen the the the, the uh, i think we seen the, the beginning of the paradigm i know some companies are more advanced than others but I think we only we haven't seen everything that people can think about. The, the, the simple idea that now you can maybe possibly distribute an update of your library with a script that says, hey, run this on your database and uh, on your code. And then you can adopt the new version. And yeah, I could make a breaking change. Because it's fine. I didn't break your usage. Here are the facts. And, oh, and did I mention randomness? I mean, if you're going to have to trust robots to change your code, you're going to have to trust them that they're not lying to you when uh, they actually run and say, yeah, see, the tests are still passing. I didn't break anything. If you want to know more, uh, I had only space for two because they have very long titles. I was told by a colleague that it's actually a tactic to be sure that if you, uh, that there is, they have all their for the name for themselves. Uh, the first one is an example from an old co-worker of mine, Fred, who runs the, the, the Paris user group now. Uh, I think he did that for a GUI library at my previous company, but I'm not entirely sure. Anyway, it's a pretty, it's a, it's a good introduction uh, on uh, what you can do with it, with example of how you, how to write your own changes. It's a very hot topic. Every major conference has at least one talk about what I did with libtooling. Uh, CppCon has one every year, CPP now has one every year, there's a bunch of them. And then if you want more to talk about the theory, the first part of quality, software capital, and all that stuff, like a lot of the ideas I took about quality come from the idea of software capital that was coined by David Sankel, uh, 2006. Uh, pretty good talk. Uh, some people have said it should have been a keynote. I kind of agree. Uh, it's a long discussion about why you want quality. Um, and I mean, it's made by a finance company, so I guess they know, they know a thing or two about investment. <coughs> oh, and furthermore, I think your build should be destroyed. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. I've had some success in um, making some of the arguments to bosses and managers for these kinds of changes by pitching them the idea that functionality is like an asset. We want that because we can sell it to clients. They'll pay money for it. The code that produces it, however, is more like a liability. Yes. Because we have to read it, change it, extend it, test it, whatever. Yes, it's uh, a... those two. Yeah, no, no, it's a, it's, it's a big thing. Like I said, like the talk I was mentioning, sadly, is in French. I don't know if there is an, uh, is there is an equivalent in a, in a, in a more uh, worldwide language. <coughs> but the idea is that the, the microservice quote, for example, <coughs> excuse me, is doing a lot of that. They're like microservices are, as the name imply, micro. <coughs> oh God, very small in scope. And the idea is that you make a V1, and then you want to make a V2 one day. You just go to the engineer and say, you know what? Just open the code, and if it looks terrible, just throw it away and write it. I don't care. It's been in production. I, I it paid for its cost. It's fine. I don't have to look at it as a as a as an investment. But yeah, one of the arguments I make for quality is, especially in C++, I think, and uh, other industries like that, that relies a lot on those code bases because they tend to be long. Like JavaScript is, as I think, in a time frame, much shorter time lapse than, uh, than C or C++. Those code bases have been around forever. And I don't think most of them are going anywhere, whatever your manager says. And so, yeah, I think that's one of the big arguments. I agree, maybe we should look at more at uh, the code and say, yep, it paid off. We shipped, we got money, we got contracts. Now we can throw it away. But I know most of them will never hear that argument. And I mean, if you can have it, then I mean, that's another way of getting quality, right? If you rewrite it, you can rewrite it better the next time. I mean, that's, that's how we learn, I guess. But, uh, or you can just make it at least more modern and use more modern practices, which is also something you want to do. But uh, in a lot of cases, you can't. Uh, you, have to, you have to reuse it, you will reuse it. And then the argument for quality is even bigger. It's like, it's gonna cost us a lot. Like I said, the writable strings that uh, broke like free programmers. I'm not sure, maybe one of them quits. Like, I mean, that's the kind of stuff. And you have a question. More of, a, more of a, an argument than a question, by the way. <laughs> you have to have one. Yes. How did you get bitten by randomness that you hate it so much? <sighs> I mean, 
several reasons, but oh yeah, uh, I had um, I had a mandatory job. It had to be green. Uh, like I think it, it run ten tests every night. They had to be green for you to be accepted as a merge. <sighs> At least a third of them failed half the time for technical reasons. And the QA did not understand the problem. They just bug booked Jira. So I spent half my mornings on Mondays. Uh, I think I spent most of my mornings at the end uh, just saying, oh, it's just technical. Please repush manually and then check them one by one. Say, yep, the repush is green. You can actually accept my changes. Like that gets so tedious. Pe the first argument people put is like, can we just remove those? And yeah, you can't, but also then you have no more tests. You had a question, yes. Yeah, uh, you were mentioning pull requests earlier. Yes. And, uh, the, the time needed for automated tests before you can, uh, can merge. Yes. But then we end up in this uh, long debate re regarding rebase or merge. Uh, <sighs> what's your opinion? Uh, so, yeah, uh, I've had this debate before and people saying, okay, if you use fast forward only, uh, the problem is you need to rerun the test every time you rebase. And if your project has more than three people working on it, you're always rebasing and rerunning the test. Yeah, because someone else can. Interview. Yes, um, I've seen some solutions by uh, using more robots, basically. Uh, people have said, okay, as, uh, as, as, as soon as it's been reviewed, and uh, like basically you may you, you may you, you run like a, a test at, at the at the at the version someone made it like you you, you run the you run the, the standard pipeline and you run the uh, the manual uh, review and then the guy clicks merge it doesn't actually merge it goes in a queue somewhere and the queue the only thing it does is take the next commit rebase apply green merge else skip send back and boom 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 Basically, the robot becomes a scheduler and you just take the, the commit one by one. That's one way if you want fast forward only and to be sure that you will... At this point, you don't even have to run your ma uh, job on, on your master branch because the master head is always the last commit you validated just because you, before you did fast forward merge. So that's one option. Uh, on the other way, if you're willing to accept that sometime your master will actually get read because of... Uh, the fact that the, the, the actual merge created a conflict that you could not see in the, in the pull request. That could be a way, but then you have to institute like a, a rule that is, okay, if master is red, I do not merge anything except something that makes it green. And that one will have to be fast forward. That's an option. Again, I mean, if you, I, you can, I've done both. I mean, I, I haven't done the full bot yet. I wish I had, I know some companies do. Uh, I, I, I like it. I think it's more uh, guaranteed to have like uh, honest quality. You're 100% sure your integration bar will always be green because the robot will literally never merge it unless fast forward passes all the tests. But it requires a bit more infrastructure. I don't know if some like paid for solutions actually have a way to say like rebase and merge until it's fine, like with a queue system. There should probably, I mean, there's a way someone has automated that, obviously. But I don't know of any solution on top of my head. I know some companies, I think Google has that, for example, but they have everything custom. So I don't know if it's a product you can buy. Probably not, but I wouldn't be surprised. Like that would be something I would sell in an enterprise edition, for example, if you want to make like, I, I mean, if I was selling, I, I'm not saying that so far, so I can't actually tell you, but that, that would be my guess. If not just, yeah, very, you can just say, okay, let's go with merge. But then the first thing happens, if, if anything is read, the only thing accepted is a fast forward merge that, uh, that fixes the build. Anything else, nope, not going to happen. And then you, you check with your team, how often does it happen? If it happens every, free, every, every month, then sure, fine. If it happens much more regularly, then maybe you should look into the other. When uh, Microsoft went to Git, it happened basically all the time. Yeah, because they have a large it's scale. Huge. And I don't know how they solved that, but they actually did exactly what they did. yeah, the build bots. Yeah, I think I, I think that's the best thing. Like you flag the merge for a bot to actually pick it and uh, and and rebase it. And automatically uh, rebased until it got stuck, and then you have to do it manually. But I haven't seen any commercial things you can use yourself. Well, if anyone is watching, there is a business opportunity there. I think because <laughs> I would pay for that stuff. Yes. Yes, about continuous integration. Yes. Uh, what you 
consider continuous integration, what is maximum time between commit is created and either merged to mainline or definitely rejected? So it's still. I guess it varies from company to company and how fast is your. Re well, pff, I, personally, I would say if it's done during the day, I don't mind. But, uh, I mean, it depends on how big all the features you do, right? Like, if most of the features I work on take me several hours to work on anyway, I can wait another couple of hours for that to be burned. I'm not going to die from it. And then also depends, like, do you need to get it in the nightly build if you have, like, nightly tests or if you, like, deploy... Like, frequency of deployment is the big question. Like, how fast do you deploy? Uh, my video game, we, uh, we push the, the beta version to beta tester every night, for example. So if you have something very important, like, for example, Usually don't open a, a merge request on Friday night if you want people to play over with the weekend. That's, the, that's usually the big, con the, the, big, the big bottleneck is, oh, I really want feedback on this, uh, on this feature I made. And the biggest feedback we get is obviously people playing on the weekends or beta testers because they're just like random people who play our games for free in the weekend and give us bug reports. Yes, you really want it in the, you want, you want it in the, in, in the build that is going to be made on Friday night because nobody's going to merge it on Saturday. I mean, unless you have a company that works on Saturday, but that's another question. Yes? Uh, if you get your work started from a legacy code base from C, there's uh, someone transformed the code, and there's no mutability control, there's no accessibility control, so something like there's no private um, protected, and there's also no constantness and the mutability. Is it fairly easy using this uh, larger SQL code refactoring to fix this? Well, basically the example I was, uh, I was, I was, I was giving is, uh, yeah, people who were using C before const existed. So every, 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 every literal was a char star. And then when they started became const char star, they just used f write table strings to not have to change all the strings in the code. And then they had APIs that were built around the fact that all strings were basically char stars. And like I said, they burned three programmers until the fourth one said, I'm writing something in Clang automated. It may have had to fix some manually, but I think most of it was just writing a Clang tidy thing that just spread the constness like virally uh, up until there was either a conflict of API that he really needed to solve, like someone was actually relying on it, which he shouldn't have, like someone was actually modifying it, which would have been a bug anyway. Uh, most of the time, it was just making all the APIs that, that start from string literals virally const until it was done. There's, that's, and, and with that, we managed to get rid of it. And, and we could actually drop the f right table strings and move to C++11. That was, I don't know, like four years ago. He made a talk about it, but it's again in French. I don't know if there is an English version, uh, maybe at CPPP. I am not entirely sure. I could check. I'm actually, what I mean is more, more interested to the case, like a, function, a member function should be a constant member function. For those cases, is it easy, they, they can detect it, like you get something. <sighs> yeah, no, actually, uh, with a complex enough matcher, you could probably check if there is a non const access or not of a variable in a function, or if there is an immutability applied and then have auto suggested const. That. Sh that, I mean, that seems plausible, right? You just have to iterate over everything under a function node and say, do you do a right, uh, a right access on this uh, on member variables, yes or no? Or do you call a non-const matter? If there is none, then it could be const. I think the compiler already turns into day. Uh, if you make something const, it turns into a constant. Or maybe it was reshorted at that. Yeah, but I, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if tools had that. Yeah. That doesn't sound like something impossible to do. Question. Do you have any tooling that you use to enforce reproducing builds? Like you were saying that's important. Do you have any kind of CS? A uh, tool for what? For enforcing re reproducing builds. <sighs> I mean, not really. I mean, the tool itself is just the fact that your pipeline runs and is, is, is like work. Uh, so what I mean the problem is of course like r randomness in tests is one of them uh, and the other one is going to be uh, I've had uh, I have a lot of infrastructure issues in the past like underscaled or whatever uh, like half the errors was like oh docker tried to boot and it could not reserve an image big enough and then it couldn't compile or no space left on device is my favorite uh, I really, really is it really is my strong opinion that no programmer should spend his time fixing like re Jenkins, please rebuild because I run out of space. It's just like space is free at this point almost. Like you can go on Amazon and buy like a bazillion of it for nothing. 
it's insane the amount of man hours we spend of engineering fixing stuff that could just be sold by buying more hardware like and that's that's the big thing google realized like an engineer could be in europe in america it doesn't doesn't matter it costs a lot to make them do anything on the other hand hardware is cheap and i can hire more hardware by the time i finish reading a slide like have, having more high engineers uh fixing those kinds of problems is not scalable it takes forever to hire them and also most of the time they don't want to do that job because it's boring and very repetitive and we hate that so yeah no just like yeah it's it's that good old idea that you need to spend money to make money. Like, yes, you want to save money on all those things. Well, spend. Uh, you want to save money? Well, spend more money. You save in junior time by spending money on hardware. Like, that's, that's the thing. Okay, thanks, Matthew. Thank you.